everyone, and welcome to the session, which will be about mixed criticality support in SEL4. We are lucky to have Grenoble Heiser uh, talk about the application to flying autonomous aircraft. He is uh, the, the father of formally validated operating systems for uh, safety applications, and we are indeed honored to have him here today. He will be speaking for 40 minutes, and at the end there will be questions. And with that, I turn you over to our main featured act here. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I make it to LCA every three years or so. Um, just to sort of, as um, truth in advertising, the title of the talk is a bit of a switch and bait. I'm not talking about flying aircraft or so. I'm, I'm talking about the underlying technology that's needed for enabling that. And that's the, the general area of mixed criticality support and in spe specifically as it applies to SEL4. So why should you listen to this talk anyway? Um, oh, great. PowerPoint does this. All you need is to read. <laughs> um, so, why should you listen to this anyway? I'll explain what mixed criticality systems are and um, why, why that's an important concept. Um, what, what is needed for being able to certify them? Um, in particular, what kind of operating system support is needed in terms of spatial and temporal isolation? how we do that in SEL4, and then what we can use it for. So if this is boring, you can leave now. I won't be offended. <laughs> so what's this cyber, um, this mixed criticality stuff? It's, it's all about the, the needs of present and in particular emerging cyber physical systems, which are characterized by growing functionality, um, a lot of it being safety critical if you have a um, an aircraft that's fly-by-wire, as they all the modern ones are, that's obviously a lot of safety-critical um, electronics. If they're autonomous, then that's becoming even more critical. Similar things with autonomous cars, um, but also things like um, fact, fact, factory automation, etc. Um, they're also characterized when they're safety-critical, particularly when they're life-critical, by expensive certification processes. And keeping the certification costs manageable is a, a core motivator for what, what kind of technology support is needed. Um, but because the cost of these certifications is among, humongous and at least linear in the number of lines of code, probably super linear. And so to give a little bit of context, this is the um, F35 in the Australian press often called the flying heap of crap. Except it, <laughs> except it doesn't always seem to fly. It's got um, 8 million lines of code on the system. Um, this is the greatest aircraft, at least from the customer's point of view, and it's got 120 million lines of code in there. So these are enormously complex systems. And so how, how do you manage getting this software right and, and certified? The traditional approach to that is physical separation. So you have some actuator which is driven by the inputs of a sensor. So you connect both of them to a microcontroller and then the um, thing can do its job. And if you have multiple, then you use different microcontrollers for each functionality. This is pretty much how cars, for example, have been built for a long time and how aircraft have been built for a long time. The problem with this is this is what your little microcontroller becomes when it's put in a car. It's a big thing and it's very costly and it's not very costly to buy, it's very costly to manufacture because um, a car under the hood of a car, it's a very hostile environment for electronics. It needs to be waterproof, dustproof, graveproof, acidproof, very resistant to vibration, means, which means very sturdy connectors and operate over a wide temperature range and that's why it's encapsulated in such a big bulk. This is a millimeter square microcontroller that's in there. That's pretty much it. It's amazing, right? So if you think about having all these microcontrollers for every bit of functionality, and in cars, the number of microcontrollers reached 100 about five or 10 years ago. 
um, you can see there's, there's a little bit of a scalability problem because these things, they weigh a lot, the cabling weighs a lot, they consume a lot of space, and they draw a lot of energy. So we talk about the space weight and power swap problem. And um, that grows, becomes more and more of a problem the more functionality you have. And that's across automotive and aerospace, etc. And the additional challenge is, well, the, the single, mo single model of one sensor to one actuator doesn't really work. It works for very simple systems, but in general, there needs to be interaction. There's sensor fusion, et cetera, where things have multiple inputs. Multiple inputs go to multiple functionalities, et cetera. So this physical separation model doesn't work for scalability, and it doesn't work for functionality either. So the obvious thing is you consolidate. You need a bit more quantum microprocessor and just put everything on that one which is cool because that reduces your swap, swap problem and it gives you the ability to integrate things properly and sort of for autonomous vehicles there's just no alternative to that. The challenge is of course you le lose the nice properties of physical isolation. In this physical isolated system I know if something goes haywire the rest is unaffected. That's no longer the case and somehow I need to get the same isolation in different ways. Okay. And you need to do it in a way that get, lets you get the software certified or the overall system. And every part of a critical system must be certified. What does that mean? You need to convince a certifier, um, which is generally some organization, in the end it's a person who decides to give a stamp, that this thing is safe. And how do, they, do you do that? This is the so-called assurance process. Um, so you. It basically involves killing a lot of trees. So you have extensive um, documentation for specification, for development documentation, for all your test regimes and what they produced, et cetera, et cetera. There's expensive code inspection um, and there is um, a requirement of tracing all the, the safety requirements of the system to the actual code. And you can imagine for a system that's of non-trivial size, this is a very expensive process. And changing every line of code is extremely expensive because you have to go through this whole crap again. Um, <clears throat> and in the end, you have to come up with a convincing argument that there's no out of spec behavior and that's basically what's called safe then. So, if your system is more than a, at most a few thousand lines of code, that's just prohibitive, you can't do it. Okay. So how do we certify the consolidated system, scratch, scratch? Um, oh, well, let's use software isolation, right? So we know this, this is a well-established concept. People have been using it since the Stone Ages. We have operating systems that uh, provide address spaces where you can isolate things. So you put that in an operating system and then put the um, isolation barrier in the sense of address spaces around that. Except, of course, Almost all operating systems are pretty hopeless at this because that's not what they do. They do this. They put, for example, all your device drivers in the kernel, including a well, um, very popular open source operating system ending with X. So you can't use this kind of system for safety critical systems of any significant complexity because you have a huge trusted computing base. Everything can potentially affect everything. Um, so you, you cannot make a, a isolation argument which you require for safety. And um, to make things worse, there's different, in general, there's different things of different degree of safety criticality on your system. And for example, the avionics uh, industry the, um, defines five safety levels depending on the effect they have if something malfunctions. Goes from no effect, um, which is like when a light burns out, to a catastrophic, which means that airplane does a hard landing and um, you try to avoid that. Okay, so in order to support this kind of stuff and in particular the cooperation, the co-location of uh, things of different criticality, which is what's called a multi-criticality system, is you need some sort of um, not this kind of approach here, which um, is basically a failure in terms of safety, but you need something that gives you real isolation all the way through. 
And this is what we call a microkernel. And in particular, there is this thing called SEL4, which is the um, arguably most secure and safe microkernel in the world because it has actual mathematical proofs for its assurance. And with that, you can actually go further and really separate everything, all the drivers and, um, and the control code from each other. Obviously, they need to communicate, so there is explicit communication channels, so the control can read the sensor and drive the actuator. And um, for the other functionality, the same. And of course, we can integrate that for our sensor fusion, where the control talks to multiple sensors and multiple sensors to multiple controls, etc. But also importantly, where we don't open explicit channel, there is no communication possible. And there is some guarantees about that. So this is really one of the core fund, uh, requirements for safety critical systems. And SEL4 supports that by providing isolation by default. And if you don't want the isolation, if you want to enable communication, you need to explicitly enable it by providing an explicit communication channel. And the operating system kernel will guarantee you that this is how communication is possible and nothing else. So the core mechanisms, like a lot of systems that take security and safety seriously, for that is so-called capabilities. How many of you have heard of capabilities as a protection mean, Oh, wow, I'm predicting to the converted. So I don't really need to say much here. Um, a capability is basically a protected pointer that encapsulates an object reference and some access rights. And there's different ways to represent these. And it is prima facie evidence of an access. So if you present a capability to the system with a desired operation, if that operation is enabled by the capability, the system will perform the operation and else it will not. And, exact, and that's the only condition. So you get this sort of um, object-oriented invocation where basically you're invoking methods on capabilities. Um, the real ad the nice advantage of CAPS is they give you very fine-grained access control. And that's nice for um, reasoning about isolation and system. What can affect what? If you know that it can only have an effect if it has a capability explicitly enabling that effect, then that makes it easy to reason about um, how, how things can interact. So in SEL4, we have um, two, six, eight types of capabilities. For very, and each sort of represents a, a basic kernel object. So there's a threat control block capabilities, they represent threats. There's address space capabilities, they represent basically their thin wrap around page tables. Um, there's so called endpoints, these are basically ports for communication. So this is, if you have an endpoint capability, you can send a message or receive a message from that endpoint. Um, so that's message passing IPC. There's notifications, which are basically arrays of binary semaphores. So that's for asynchronous signaling. Um, and then there's capability storage, because somehow you have to, um, somewhere you have to um, store your capabilities that define your protection domain. Um, that's an object type. And there's frames, which is physical memory, which you can address, uh, map into address spaces. And then there's, um, architecture dependent interrupt objects for which I don't have a, uh, an icon. And then there is untyped or free memory, which is basically memory that you can use freely by converting it into any of the other uh, object types. And that's how um, resource control works in SEL4. As you can see, this is all spatial objects. There's no notion of time yet. And that's, that was one of the long-standing issues with SEL4, is that we don't have a sane, uh, sound concept of controlling time. And we now have that. But before I get to that, um, what is really makes SEL4 unique is its verification story. So there is formal proofs of its security and safety properties. What that means is this is, the kernel is implemented in C with a bare minimum of a few thousand, a few dozen lines of assembler. Um, there's an abstract model, which is written in a mathematical logic, which explicitly defines the operational semantics of the kernel. So that defines exactly what function is possible and what is not. And then there's a formal proof, machine check mathematical proof, 
that the C implementation is correct against the spec, which means the C cannot operate out of spec. And that's provably so, provided the C operates correctly. Um, well, okay, we don't want to trust the C compiler, so there's an additional proof um, that the binary is a correct translation of the C, and that means we can use GCC, and it, um, we, we protect, we don't know it's not going to introduce any bugs. And then there is um, proofs that the abstract model is good in the sense that it enforces the um, typical CIA properties you need for security. So that, that basically means there's a a complete security story from high-level requirements down to the code that runs on the silicon. In addition, and that's the only operating system kernel in the world that has this. Um, in addition, there is also a sound and complete worst-case execution time analysis of the kernel, which is, of course, one of the prerequisites for being able to do hard real-time. We know the upper bound of any kernel operations. And again, it's the only protected mode kernel I know for which this a sound and complete worst-case execution time analysis has been done. Um, besides that, it's the world's fastest microkernel. Um, I challenge anyone to show me a faster one, and anything I've seen was at least factor of two, typically more like a factor of ten slower. Um, just for truth in advertising, there is a bit, um, a few things that are not completely verified yet. They're all work in progress. For example, kernel boot is not yet proven correct. Um, there's some MMU operations that are modeled at a more abstract level and multi-core works, performs well, but is not, not yet verified, but that's all in progress. But in terms of the mixed criticality story, the thing that is really missing is any reasoning about time. I said we had a um, sound worst case bounce for the latency of kernel operations, that's one thing you need, but we don't have any ways in the existing model of reasoning about what can actually, what guarantees we can make in terms of timeliness of um, processes when there's multiple processes with multiple um, priorities around. So this is what we need here and what this talk is really about. It's about this temporal isolation property. How can we enforce that and make guarantees about timeliness? And in, in particular, what we're worried about is this is our mixed criticality system, right? There's some highly critical functionality that's probably only a few hundred lines control code and which we are really damn sure that it's correct and we're happy to take that to the certifier. But then we need to show that nothing else can mess with it. So in particular, if there's a less critical code on which there's likely to be tens or hundreds of thousands of lines, whatever that less critical code does must not affect the ability of the highly critical code to achieve its deadlines. So this interference must be precluded. And um, we do that by introducing a new scheduling model. <coughs> now, um, classical L4 scheduling is actually very primitive. It's just a simple fixed priority around Robin scheduler. That sounds pretty um, lame compared to the complexity of scheduling in Linux, for example, but it's actually for a good reason because this is sort of one of the things you need for hard real time is you actually need hard priorities. You don't want the system to mess with your priorities at all. There's no priority change without explicitly requesting that by suitably privileged user level code. So the basic idea of having this fixed priority hard priorities is, is a good one, but it's not sufficient. Um, <clears throat> because by definition of priority, right, the highest priority job can monopolize the CPU. So what this system allows you is guarantee deadlines for one process, the highest priority one, nothing else. And that's not sufficient for mixed criticality system. And I'll give you an example of that. So this is uh, something you might have, you will have in many autonomous vehicles, is you have a control loop, and that's a really critical thing that executes every 10 to 100 milliseconds typically, um, so at a relatively low rate. And then there is other stuff, for example, network drivers. And of course, they, they expect a much more timely response. Your network doesn't want to wait 100 milliseconds till it gets a chance to, to process its packet. You'll lose packets all over the place. So in order to give, so the, the um, 
the control loop is the critical thing. The network thing is the one that needs fast response time. And in order to get the system perform well, you need to be able to give this um, network components uh, time whenever it gets its interrupt without it being able to monopolize the system and therefore lock out the control loop. So that, that means in a fixed priority scheduling scheme, the network driver needs to be given a high priority. So when an interrupt comes in, it can preempt the control loop, but we need to stop it from monopolizing. In other words, we make sure that it only gets a small time window and then um, the control loop gets its time again. So that's one issue we need to resolve. The other one is in any realistic mixed criticality system, there's sharing, including across um, criticalities. For example, um, in our UAVs, there is some, um, some component that talks to the ground station that updates waypoints. That's a low critical thing because if it loses a communication, it will retry, etc. Um, the same waypoints are used by the flight control. That's highly critical. And um, so the two, the, the high and the low critical system need to share data structures that get updated by both sides. Um, so you have a classical mutual exclusion problem, which me, and there's several ways to implement it. Typically you encapsulate that in a server, so it's running protected in its own address space, and that can be done synchronously or asynchronously. So the one model is you have a IPC, a blocking IPC operation where the client talks to the server, the server executes a critical section and then replies back. So that gives you a hostile monitor and it has nice properties we all know about. Or the other is you use um, just semaphores to uh, synchronize these things and um, then you get a, a different synchronization model that's more appropriate for running on separate cores, whereas the hostile monitor, of course, is the right way to do it on a single core. So there you have this case where two components share a server. Um, the components are of different criticality. Obviously, the server, because the high critical thing depends on it, needs to be also of high criticality, and that needs to be certified, etc. But you need to stop the low critical um, client to monopolize the server in a way that the high critical client gets locked out. So sharing is very important. And for those who know about real-time theory, this simple model, if you associated a fixed uh, ceiling protocol with a server, automatically gives you the so-called priority ceiling protocol locking, which has some nice properties. In particular, it has very low overheads and um, uh, it's provably deadlock free and has reasonably, not the best possible, but fairly good uh, worst case blocking times. So that's all nice. Okay, but if we do this sort of in a uh, system like the existing SA04 kernel, then there's some problems with that. So imagine we have these two clients, they invoke the server, and so the, first the server is running, it blocks waiting for requests coming in. Um, the first client sends a message to the server, the server operates on, on behalf of that client, it is operating on the highest priority, which means it gets as much time as it wants. Eventually, it comes around to applying back to the client. The client has actually not used any time, so it still has um, its full time slice and just sends back to the server and invokes the next request. So basically, um, that client can dominate the server and therefore the system because the server is high priority and effectively DOS the other client and we need to have a way of preventing that. Okay, so with this, um, let me summarize what I see as the requirement for mixed criticality systems. We obviously need certifiable isolation, both in the spatial sense, which is sort of well established and understood, but also in the temporal sense, and that's much less understood. And what it specifically means is that we are able to guarantee deadlines for high critical processes without making any assumptions uh, about the low critical processes. So the low critical ones are essentially considered malicious and the high critical ones still need to be, have their deadlines guaranteed. Um, we need to sh share resources typically in the 
um, sense of service across criticalities because that's just a, re um, a real life requirement. And, and this is important and its core motivation for mixed criticality is we want to have good utilization. One of the problems with the, the classical approach of physical separation is it gives you overall poor utilization. Um, there is an actual existing avionics standard for mixed criticality system um, that basically transports that model onto a single processor by using strict space and time partitioning. Ex again, this gives you very low utilization because you, every partition needs to budget for its worst case execution time. And the, the worst case execution time is typically orders of magnitude over longer than the average execution time. And therefore, you get very poor utilization. So being able to reuse slack, obviously for low critical stuff, because you can't depend on getting any, is really important to get the thing utilized. And utilization is really a core motivator for this consolidation thing. And, um, and somehow I doubled up here, so sorry. <laughs> Um, and because we want to do this in SEO4, um, because it's a very good basis for it, we want to uh, integrate time into the capability system. So how do we do that? Well, turns out it's not actually that difficult if you come up with the right model. And the right model is basically replacing the concept of a time slice by a first class object, which is the, the scheduling context. So classical scheduling parameters are just priority and time slice. So you have a priority, and if you get scheduled, then you run for your time slice, and then get, you pre get preempted, and the schedule invokes. Um, in SEL4, the mixed criticality SEL4, we simply replace this time slice by a more general con uh, concept called the op scheduling op context capability. So it's a capability to a new kernel object, which is the scheduling context. And um, it, it has a, a number of things associated with it, but the main attributes are a period and a budget. And if you set the budget the same as the period, then it pretty much behaves like the existing time slice, so it emulates the existing system. But if the budget is less than the period, then you get, um, basically you get throttled to being able to use no more than a certain amount of time. So basically the scheduling context object guarantees that this process will not consume more than t, um, c over t CPU bandwidth. And that simple trick is really what you need to um, enable mixed criticalities. So for example, um, we can have a scheduling context that has a period of three and a budget of two, so it allows you to use up to two thirds of the CPU time. And then there's another one where you have a period of a thousand and a um, budget of 250, so it allows you to use up to 250, uh, up to 25% of CPU time. Whether those two can coexist and still guarantee all that CPU time is, um, Turns out the theory says, yes, in this case, it's possible. But generally, you can't use 100% of CPU time. There's some inherent schedulability limits. Um, but basically, it means that if, if we use this approach, which is called um, rate monotonic scheduling, which I've implicitly been using, that um, shorter period means higher priority then this would be the highest priority process. It leaves one third of um, CPU time over. And then we can reason about whether that's enough to run this one. And if it's enough, then we can guarantee this one's deadline. If not, then we're out of luck. So basically, we're limiting the time high priority processes can consume and doing that with a capability-based uh, model for time. And there is, um, how do you assign these values? Well, there's a certain privilege required to do that. And possession of that privilege basically means they have the right to do access con uh, admission control in the system. So the kernel doesn't do any admission control because that's very policy heavy. And the microkernel shouldn't have any policy. You should be able to implement that in, on top. So what guarantees can we make in this system? Um, so we have now the, the Shadler invariant which 
traditionally is the kernel will always run the highest priority threat. And then there is um, a round robin rule for um, catching break evens. And we now modify that the highest priority threat that has non um, zero budget. So a thread is only runnable if it has budget left. If it doesn't have budget, it will have to wait until its next period is up and then the budget gets refreshed. And then there's some complicated real-time theory behind it, what's the right way of doing this exactly, because you want to make sure that the bandwidth cannot ex be exceeded even for a short period of time, etc. cetera. Um, I'll skip over that. And then within the pe uh, period, the threads are scheduled round robin. And that's enough to guarantee us, under certain circumstances, time for processes that are not running at highest priority. In, this is a simple example, a medium, a high, and a low priority, uh, criticality process. The medium one has the shortest period, so that could be, this is like from the previous example, the, the, the network driver. Um, it's given a very short, small budget, so only 10% of CPU bandwidth. It runs at highest priority, so it will get the CPU whenever it wants it, but only up to one milliseconds per 10 milliseconds. And then the high critical thing, which could be the control loop, is running at a much lower period, a uh, longer period, and we give it a medium priority. It is given a budget that represents 50% bandwidth, and the assumption is that our offline analysis of its worst case execution time shows that it doesn't need more budget than that. And if long as that analysis is right, then this guarantee means that we can guarantee the deadlines of this high critical thing, no matter how often the high priority, less critical process runs. Um, so we can guarantee this deadline. And of course, the low priority, low critical thing can use up all slack. You have a question? So how can we do shared servers? Well, in this case, a shared server is something that doesn't have a scheduling context of its own. It runs on scheduling context provided by the client. And the scheduling context is passed with this IPC message when the server is invoked. So this client invokes the server, passes along its scheduling context, the server runs until completion, replies back, passes the scheduling context back to this client, and then the client keeps on executing. And the important thing is, because the server has been executing on the borrowed scheduling context of the client, the client is charged against the, for the time the server used on its behalf. And that's critical for enforcing isolation because that guarantees that the client, the one client cannot monopolize the server. Question is, what if the server runs out of budget? So the client would be malicious and just provide, um, give an insufficient scheduling context and try to DOS the other client uh, that way. Well, for this case, we have um, there's, there's a bunch of established models. Some system uh, forced the server to be multi-threaded. Um, I think that's a really bad idea because that enforces additional complexity on the server, makes it harder to certify it because concurrent code is hard, as we all know. Um, some people be believe in helping or bandwidth inheritance, um, where then the other, the waiting client's time is used to get the server out of its um, action. I think that's a bad model too because the wrong party pays for the mistake, right? Client one made a mistake by invoking the server with insufficient scheduling budget, but client B has to pay for client one's mistake. So that's really not a good way to do it. Um, we don't actually build any particular policy in there, but we provide a timeout exception. So the server gets an exception, and then there is standard templates for recovering from that. One is just reset the server. So just junk everything that was done on behalf of the stupid client who run out of budget. It's their problem if they do that. Um, or we can provide an emergency budget and, um, or change priorities, etc. But that's up to the policy defined by the system designer, and that's the way it should be because they should know what kind of response they need in their particular system. Okay, that's what we use in SEO4. And 
The same mechanism, by the way, can be used to implement different scheduling policies at user level, which is also neat because at the moment we have a priority-based scheduling, which industry is very happy with. Um, academia despises because it has some um, usability or utilization limit. In general, you can't utilize your system more than 70%, um, and some people find this um, obnoxious. Reality is the typical utilization issues are more like orders of magnitude. But to make them happy, we can actually implement EDF on top um, at user level. Okay, what does this all cost? So these are micro benchmarks done on an arm, one megahertz, uh, gigahertz arm. These are all cycles. That shows the main line, which is the fastest kernel on that architecture uh, anyway and the new MCS kernel for some critical operations. So call is the IPC operation that the client uses to invoke the server. Reply and receive is what the server uses to um, get requests and reply to them from the client. Um, and the, the overhead is in the noise. IRQ latency goes up about 11% and that's a result of we need to Whenever an interrupt comes in, we need to reprogram the timer, and there's a cost to that to enforce our budget. Semaphore signaling, other important operation, overhead is in the noise. Scheduling is a bit, becomes a bit more expensive by 20%. Again, this is because we have to reprogram the timer. But 1,000 cycles for scheduling is like an order of magnitude faster than Linux does it. Um, to show you the isolation actually works, we've got away a lot of benchmarks, but I'll skip over. I'll just show this um, second one here. Um, just to show that the system actually does isolation. So we run a high priority CPU hog with a limited budget and a lower priority um, UDP echo server that represents our highly critical task. And um, that needs very little time for each invocation. And this is what we get. So the budget is what the CPU hog gets. So the total period is 10 milliseconds. And the, CP, the hog gets a budget of 1, 2, 3, up to 10. And CPU utilization is pretty much linear in that because the lower priority thread uses almost no time. The important thing is what's the latency experienced by the lower priority UDP thread. And you can see the best case latency is essentially zero. The worst case latency, which is the critical one, is exactly the budget given to the CPU hog, which means, yes, worst case, it has to wait for the CPU hog to exploit its complete budget. And we know we have a limited latency for the, um, the critical thread. So its, its latency is bounded by the budget we give to the higher um, priority thread, so which is exactly what we want to see. So basically it works and we've run way more complicated stuff, uh, but I don't have time to go through that. Just want to show you that I mentioned, okay, we can, we have a fixed priority scheduler, but we can do EDF at user level for those who really want it. And here's a comparison of our user level EDF scheduler implementation compared to the in-kernel EDF scheduler of Litmus RT, which is the um, widely used um, real-time scheduling test bed that's based on Linux. And we see even that though we are doing our scheduling at user level, we do it faster than uh, Linux does it in the kernel. Um, that's a nice result. Okay, so which basically means this is actually usable, right? It would be nice to, if you have a nice model, it doesn't help you if the overheads are high. The overheads are really low. We can do, we're actually faster than Linux, even if we do stuff in user level. And so we can use it for real systems. And these are some of the ones we use it for. Um, this is the DARPA HackEMS program that just concluded last year, um, where we basically work with um, uh, autonomous vehicles. There's two research platforms. This is a US Army um, robotics reference platform. And the other is an off-the-shelf 
off-the-shelf drone where we did replace the processor board and um, all the software. And on this, we can basically do everything from scratch. So it's a nice um, greenfield playing ground. And this is uh, used for developing the technology. And then there are the real-world vehicles, um, two military platforms. This is a US Army trucks that are autonomous, the operating. They run around Detroit um, without drivers. And the other one is a Boeing full-size autonomous helicopter uh, that's um, also operational. And where there we put our software in. And the primary objective of the HACMS program was to protect them from cyber attack. So the, the, the demo versions of them did actually work, ran on the old SEO4 system, but it runs just as well on the new SEO4 system. And we could show that we keep, could keep the hackers out. Um, just to show you a, a bit of what it looks like inside, so this is our drone. It has two processor boards that was intentionally done to um, represent the um, architecture of the Boeing helicopter. So it's got a flight control board um, that has basically the cerebellum of the system that runs the e Kronos Artos, which um, Sebastian talked about yesterday and um, runs on an ARM M3, and then the main processor, which is on an A15, um, runs some critical stuff, the command and control, the um, communication between, um, with some critical parts and the uh, flight comp computer, and um, a couple of Linux virtual machines that contain big legacy software. So these are all, um, relatively simple critical code that's in principle certifiable and this is the huge legacy nightmare of millions of lines of code which you don't want to trust and part of the trust model was this gets compromised and on the Boeing vehicle they actually did a mid-flight attack where the, the Linux VM was compromised by we gave the, key, the root password to the attackers and um, <laughs> to make that job a bit easier, not that we didn't think they could break into Linux. And, um, and they showed, yes, the Linux was handling the video feed, so they could compromise the video feed, put there whatever they wanted, but they couldn't break out of the system and affect the rest of the system, and it could just um, reboot the Linux VM, and um, then stuff started from beginning again. So the, the architecture in there is actually more complex than necessary. This is an artifact of them using um, AADL frameworks, architecture analysis and description language that produce a lot of independent tasks that all get synchronized by critical sections. So these are critical sections implemented as shared servers and you can see there's lots of them. From scratch I would have made a much simpler design. Okay, so in summary, we have a new mixed criticality kernel that um, I believe meets all the requirements of mixed criticality systems. In particular, it has performance that is on pretty much in line with the fastest kernel that was ever built. It is certifiable and at the moment actually undergoing formal verification. Um, it's based on capabilities for reasoning about time, flexible model that allows us to implement arbitrary policies and this works in real world systems and I can talk, but I don't have time, about the development process, um, and I'll just conclude here. So we have two minutes for questions. Since we have no uh, questions microphone, we'll ask the speaker to repeat the question. Yes. So this is the, the, the yeah, oh, sorry. How many bugs did we find in the formal verification? Um, the original verified kernel, which was there done nine years ago, we found 450 bugs, and they were pretty much equally split between high level spec, the intermediate design, and the C implementation. And they were from all over the place. But we didn't do any testing, right? Testing is for um, weaklings. We do formal <laughs> verification. <laughs> Uh, it's about 10,000 lines of code. Um, you were talking about using static analysis to prove that 
we're not using static analysis. We're using static analysis for the worst case execution time yeah. analysis. Oh, yes, and okay. we were talking about guarantees for that worst case yeah. execution. Does that imply that the set of servers that can be running is fixed? Please repeat the question. Um, your worst case execution time analysis, does it rec make an assumption of a fixed number of services? No, it does not. Um, the, the kernel, so the kernel is basically non preemptible but it has certain preemption points for long-running operations. And the only long-running operations are really destruction operations when you have to do a lot of cleanup with dependency trees. And we preempt those in a way that we make sure the system is in a consistent state. We take a preemption point. If the interrupt happens, we get out and get back in and then just continue. We have to wrap up now. Uh, thanks very much. I'm happy to answer more questions in the time.